before I forget. And this session will be placed on Each Academy as well as the RCLS YouTube channel. So this is part two of the phishing ransomware training. You did not need to attend or watch part one, um, but it does build off of that session. So I would suggest perhaps after this session to go back and just review what occurred during part one um, so that you have a more in-depth understanding. So we are joined today by Antoinette King, who has been putting forth these training sessions for us um, for a myriad of cybersecurity focuses. And uh, we're going to, like I said, continue on with phishing and ransomware part two. Um, you will at some point be prompted to turn on your cameras. So just a heads up. Mm -hmm. that's coming and I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Antoinette. So thank you. Hello. Um, thank you all for joining. It is a little bit of a smaller group um, this session than we've had in the past. I was hoping for a little bit bigger group because today we are going to be um, working through what a mock tabletop exercise for <sighs> a ransomware um, incident looks like. So, um, I mean, guess the good thing is with a smaller group is we can all do this together. We don't need any breakout groups. Um, so what I'm going to ask, because this is 100% interactive, if you can put your camera on, um, that would be really super helpful because uh, we are going to kind of go through a few phases of what a cyber incident looks like. And then I'd like to open up dialogue and ask questions to um, all of the participants. So don't be shy. Um, this is probably going to be new for everybody. And that's okay. That's the whole point, right? It's to have discussion and to kind of work through what that workflow looks like in the event that you or somebody within your library system has something flash up on the screen and all of a sudden um, you realize that you're in the middle of a, a ransomware incident. So like I said, it's going to be an open discussion. I want it to be fun. I'm so glad that Bernard is here because I feel like he's my uh, my you kind of the guy that I'm bouncing things off over the last couple of sessions. And so I'm, I'm would look forward to your uh, your input as well. And of course, we want to have fun as always. So uh, many of you have met me before. If you haven't, I'm going to do a super, super quick introduction. It's the same introduction I do for every session. Uh, my name is Antoinette King. I live in Bloomingburg, so I am local. Uh, my son goes to Pine Bush schools. My oldest son, that's my youngest one. He's a junior. My oldest goes to Fordham University. Um, I've been married for about 22 years. I started in the security industry uh, just about the same time ago, 22 years, and um, as a technician. And so I used to install physical security equipment and got involved in networking back then because everything started transitioning from analog to digital. And uh, a few years back, I went back to school at Utica College and got my master's in cyber policy and risk analysis. And so that's a huge um, catalyst for why I do this and understanding kind of the global threat landscape and what that means when you know individual citizens and organizations are being attacked. And in particular, um, the organizations that are most vulnerable are organizations like libraries, schools, houses of worships, organizations that typically don't necessarily have a security mindset. The organizations that have a more open, welcoming mindset are those that um, I would consider to be the softer targets. Um, often they also don't have the resources in uh, available for the high level security um, controls that, that are necessarily necessary to kind of harden the target. So doing these awareness trainings is really important to me. Um, and so I really appreciate everybody spending the time and participating. So if you wouldn't mind, if you can um, put in the chat, just what your title is. I know some of you like Arlette and Mary have been here before and Bernard have been here before. Just if you could put your titles into the chat. So I understand kind of what I'm dealing with in terms of everybody's role within the library system, that'll be really helpful for me. So I'm just gonna take a minute and let everybody kind of type in what their uh, roles are. Okay. Assistant director, we've got adult services, trustee, adult services. All right, perfect. 
Um, so thank you for that. And really that's, that's good to see that we kind of have a little bit of a wide variety of roles within the organization. So, um, oh, great. Thanks, Rich. Actually, that's really, I'm so excited um, to see that you're here from the Office of the Aging. Actually, that's something that's really near and dear to my heart as well, because um, I also have a book coming out actually this week. I was just telling Jen, it's called The Digital Citizen's Guide to Cybersecurity, How to Stay uh, Empowered and Safe Online. And it's geared to individuals age 12 to 100. And I talk a lot about vulnerable people, um, which are typically our younger people and older people uh, when it comes to uh, cybersecurity and digital hygiene. So I'm really, thank you so much for being here. I also asked Jen, I'm going to be getting like a 99 cent code for my ebook. So I'm, I'm going to have Jen kind of socialize that link once it's available so that everybody can get access to the book. It's inexpensive. Um, and that way you can use it as a resource. So welcome everybody. And I'm really excited to be doing this session with you all. So this is one of my favorite quotes. Um, it especially applies to incidents um, does anybody, everybody see my, is the chat showing up in front of the slides? Or do you just see the slide? Just the slide? Okay, thank you. Um, I have it open just so I can watch, but I just wanted to make sure that you guys weren't seeing that too, so it didn't block the slide. Um, so in any moment of decision, the best thing to do is the right thing. The next best thing is the wrong thing. And the worst thing you can do is nothing. And that holds so true in when we're dealing with anything that has to do with cybersecurity or digital hygiene, right? If we do nothing, it's the worst thing that we can do. Um, so having to make any kind of decision is better than, than doing nothing. So that's kind of the mindset I'd like to have as we start going into this session. Um, so here's our quick agenda. We want to define the, the purpose and objectives, like why we're doing this. Um, I want to give a little background, and actually, I just realized the slides are are swapped. So we'll do a background first, and then we'll show you the the purpose and ob objectives. Um, we have uh, it's going to start in phases. The first phase is the attack. The second phase is going to be what the response is. Third phase is containment. Fourth phase is reporting and communications. And then the fifth phase is the after action review. So what I'm going to do is I'll, we'll go through um, the first three sections. And then as we get into phase two, I'd like to open everybody's mics and I'm going to ask some questions. And if you don't have an answer or don't know an answer, that's okay. But I want to kind of get the dialogue going so that if you were the person that this happened to, or one of your direct reports, or one of the patrons tells you this happened, I want to hear like what you think you should do, if you know what you should do, if you have a plan. So let's just keep the dialogue open because I think it's important to kind of have everybody bounce everything off of one another. The previous sessions, if you've been in them, most of them just been me talking, but this one I think is really important because um, this is going to help provide you with insights on where the gaps might be. So if you came to my very, very first session, this slide is going to be familiar. Um, and I just wanted to, again, reiterate the background of why this is important. Um, so these are some recent examples of specific library ransomware attacks. And um, so in the Northampton Area Public Library, which is New Hampshire, they were out of service for two weeks. Um, because of the type of insurance they had, they weren't even able to investigate what happened because they didn't pay for the digital forensics. So that's a problem because, you know, if you've got a small to medium or large library and, and you have several computers on your network, um, if you don't know what happened and how it happened, you're going to end up having to basically wipe all your systems clean and then start fresh. You're not going to be able to use backups necessarily because you may or not, may not reinfect your system. So understanding the type of insurance that you have, and we'll go through that in some of the things later, is really important because being down and unable to provide, provide services is one thing, but having to recover or rebuild from scratch is a completely different situation. And in some of these cases with these libraries, they had people manually in the library logging books in one by one off the shelf because they, could, they couldn't rebuild um, their, their databases. Uh, St. Louis had $145 million in records stolen. They had 17 branches that were affected and they were out of service for three days. Spartan Library, they were out for a week with 45 million plus in data records stolen. 
and Brownsburg Library, which I believe was the one that had to manually log all the books in, um, was out for a month. They were not able to provide services to their community in, for a month uh, when this incident occurred. And I don't know if anybody hears from Westchester, but this year in April, Westchester um, Library System was impacted by a ransomware attack. Thankfully, no patron data was reported stolen, but services were disrupted for about a week, a week and a half, as they had to restore um, quite a few computers. So, uh, Bernard, were you, are they part of the RCLS um, system? Uh, no. no. Okay, no, yeah. No. So what I read through, when I did a little bit of research, what I read was they had over 500 terminals that had to be defaulted, factory defaulted. So it took them over a week and a half to get those back online. So as you can see, like I said before, um, libraries are not exempt from being hit by ransomware. And in a lot of cases, they're not prepared. So if we can just start having conversations about this type of incident and what we can do. Every library is different. And when I was preparing for this, I pivoted a little bit. It was gonna be a different presentation, but last week we talked about maybe doing something like this. And I thought it was important. It landed really well in a K through 12, a very similar uh, gathering with K through 12 um, officials because every organization is different. Some have, and Jen even said, some, some have five employees and some have 50 employees. And that's gonna look different, but, um, as long as you know what your process is, then it's fine, but you just need to know what that is. So the purpose of doing it this way, this, this particular session this way, was to be able to stimulate discussion on cyber attack response process and procedure um, to create awareness of possible deficiencies within your organization. So as we go through this, I hope everybody's kind of taking notes. If, if you all want this slide deck, that I will make it available to you because I know it's a lot of information all at once and I have a tendency to speak quickly. Um, I know it's gonna be recorded, but this one in particular, I think is important for the libraries to have access to so that you can go through and really digest the content. So if you'd like that, please let me know and I'll make sure that's available. Um, we wanna offer a starting point. If you don't have an incident response plan in place right now, we wanna offer that as a starting point for you. And then of course, we this always, the, the goal of all of these trainings is to support your library in developing a stronger response um, capability. So the objectives for today is to identify the importance of including cyber incidents into incident response planning. A lot of organizations, um, whether it's schools, libraries, or even, um, you know, commercial consumer environments, they have active shooter responses, response plans, they have plans for, um, you know, weather related incidents, but cybersecurity tends to not be something that they're focused on. And primarily because it's usually an IT problem, right? So they don't, they don't think of it as a business disruption. They think of it as an IT problem, but remember cybersecurity incidents typically equate to business disruption and the inability to provide services. Um, so we want to also teach some best practices in incident response, determine how and who to contact during a cyber incident, uh, and identify the stakeholders within your organization with whom you can share this information with after we, we complete this um, activity, and then talk to them in an after action capacity to say, hey, you know, we talked through some of these things, maybe we have them in place, but I'm not sure. And if you don't know, that means that there's a deficiency in communication. So that's important to kind of think about. So before we get started, does anybody have any questions about anything that I've said so far? And there was a couple of people that joined a little bit um, later after we started. I just wanna reiterate, that this is a 100% interactive um, engagement today. And so if you have the ability to turn your camera on, I would really appreciate that. After I read the attack phase, we're gonna go into the response phase. That is going to be full dialogue. So I'm gonna ask questions and I'd like people to unmic and give me the responses that they think or questions they may have. So um, we're gonna get started. So a staff member just called you in a panic that they can't open any of their files. And when they looked, all of their files had a .ryk appended to their file name. Now, Ryuk is a real live uh, ransomware attack methodology. And, and so this is uh, based on real incident. Um, when you get to their computer, you find out that all of their file, their files have that extension and they have a Ryuk readme.txt file in every folder. The file contains directions for an email contact 
further instructions on what to do, and an offer to decrypt two files for free. No specific ransom has been mentioned yet, but um, the note mentions a Bitcoin address for payment. While you're reviewing all of this in that computer, you get two additional calls from other staff members complaining of the same thing. I wanna make a note about the fact that um, oftentimes there will be an offer to decrypt files for free, uh, maybe to one, two or three, whatever it is. And the purpose of that is that the um, bad actors want to prove to you that they have the decryption key in order to get your files back. So a while back, there were some situations where ransomware attackers would um, ask for payment in ransom for the decryption keys, and then they would give the decryption keys and they were corrupted. And so the, they paid a ransom and they couldn't get their files back. What does that mean for the bad actor? Well, believe it or not, as I mentioned um, in our last training, these ransomware gangs or organizations, they are built like businesses. And so if people aren't paying ransom, they're not making money. So what happened was that, that, you know, word would get out that if you were infected with this particular piece of malware and, and ransom was being uh, requested of you, decryption keys were corrupted and people just weren't paying the, the ransom. So now any reputable ransomware organization is going to provide um, an opportunity to decrypt some files for you to demonstrate that they have the decryption key. So what happens? Um, we are we're now aware that our computers are all being locked. We are aware that we don't have access to anything. Um, what do you, as the person that's recognizing that this is going on, what do you do? So my questions to the group is, um, do any of you that are on this call have or are aware of a cybersecurity incident response plan within your library? And you can either unmic and answer, you can answer in the chat. And if you don't, that's fine. That's that's no problem. It's just, you know, no, no ego amigo here. But are you any, is any of you or are any of you aware of an incident response plan? Okay, so Mia's working on something. So we've got no idea. One organization is working on something. Does that does everybody know what an incident response plan is? And I don't mean to I don't mean that to be disrespectful. I just want to make sure that everybody understands the language. Bernard, is this a service that RCLS provides by any chance out of curiosity? Uh, I know it's something they're working on and, and it's a, uh, not all libraries are supported by RCLS or they are now, but they won't be as of January 1st. Some of them are going off on their own, the larger libraries. So, okay. um, but, um, but I mean, definitely we're still going to be working with them to advise um, them to make sure that third party, anybody supported by a third party will still have these things in place. Perfect. So Mary mentioned disaster re response plan. Um, there are also uh, plans called disaster recovery plans. So, um, and we're gonna get to, uh, into that in another slide, but I just wanna make a note that an incident response plan and a disaster recovery plan are actually two separate things. So an incident response plan is going to list out in the event of fill in the blank incident. So whether it's active shooter, a weather related, ransomware, business email compromise, um, you will follow these steps. And there's gonna have a list of people to contact, things to do, um, steps to take, whatever that is, uh, in order to make sure that you've got all your bases covered. A disaster recovery plan identifies all of the critical functionalities of the business or organization, and then identifies how soon you need those things or how long you can be without them before it's like the business is in critical uh, condition, right? So, and then once you identify that, it also then gives you the instructions on how to bring those things back online or what the failover is going to be in the event of one of these 
emergencies. So disaster recovery is going to be different from a cyber incident than it, than it is from, let's say, a hurricane or some other type of um, physical incident. And so we, we, those usually dovetail, go hand in hand. So when you create an incident response plan for one thing, um, you need to make sure you have a corresponding disaster recovery plan as well. So if this did, so like, let's just go over some of the things that we need to have, right, in that incident response plan. Like, who do you contact within your organization once you become aware of the event? If you're the library director and you're that point of contact, do they know that they're supposed to contact you? And then if you are the director, are, are you aware of what you're supposed to do next, right? Do you have any idea who you're supposed to call? Um, do you have external stakeholders to contact? Do you have a legal team, insurance company, law enforcement? Um, there is a um, IC3, it's the FBI's uh, cybersecurity incident response um, portal, if you will, that you can contact if you are being victimized by ransomware and the FBI will, get, will the, the local FBI office will then get contacted to get involved. Um, and once, and again, do you have a team, a forensics team, for example, that's on retainer? Is all that stuff listed out? Do you know how to get in touch with them? And is it updated? So often if an organization does have an IRP, they might do it and then they just don't look at it again because they check the box because they created an incident response plan. Uh, has it been updated annually? Do you still have the same insurance company or coverages? Um, you know, has anything changed? So making sure you do these incident response plans and then making sure you annually take a look at them and you update them. And then knowing what types of cyber incidents you're covered for. Uh, sometimes, so right now, cybersecurity insurance is really wonky. Uh, some insurance companies have even stopped writing, uh, underwriting cybersecurity insurance because it's just been the Wild West and they've lost a tremendous amount of money. Uh, but other um, organization insurance companies are underwriting, but then they have really stringent stipulations as to what they will and will not cover. So if the ransomware was a result of a third party incident, like um, you know some sort of supply chain at attack, then they may or may not cover it. And you need to know what that looks like and, and how to figure that out. Um, do you engage with the criminals? They sent you a letter, they gave you contact information, they gave you a Bitcoin address. Are we supposed to respond to that? Are we supposed to you know, do, do something? Um, and this next one is really important and it's gonna lead us into the next phase is um, what do you do to contain the incident? Uh, everybody's in an emergency when something like this happens, everybody's like knee jerk response is unplug everything, just unplug it from the wall, unplug it from the network. Um, and that might not be the best thing for you to do. Uh, when, if you are covered and have the capacity to do digital forensics to investigate something like this, if you unplug a computer or you power it down, you might lose really valuable uh, evidence in the event right, of the event. And so that might not be the right thing to do. Um, so that leads us into the next phase, containment. How do you identify the scope of the attack? How do you, how do you learn how many computers have been affected? Um, do you have internal or external resources to contain the attack? So, you know, do you have a contract with RCLS? Do you know who to contact there um, if some, one of your computers actually is affected um, so that they can kind of figure out how many computers are affected? Is it there a potential that your library system could somehow infect other, you know, RCLS or other library systems based on shared resources? Um, you know, can you ensure the attackers are not still active in your network? Um, have you initiated a plan to further protect, uh, prevent spread of attack? In a lot of these other instances, uh, somebody would get on the website or do an all call and say, if you have a, a cell phone or laptop that is one of the library's resources, do not plug it in, do not turn it on if, if you haven't, right? So do not get, do not connect with the VPN, do not do anything until further notice because any one of those devices could continue to spread the attack. Um, but if you don't have the right resources and you don't know who you're supposed to contact, you really don't know what the instructions are gonna be for this. Uh, and then do you know what is needed for evidence collection? So again, do we have log files on our computer, log files that are potentially on your switches or your routers or services? Um, 
that, you know, when I say services, I mean applications, right? So log files within the applications could be Outlook, could be any of those things. Um, will that contain evidence? It may, right? So how do we get access to it? Uh, maybe it means disconnecting the network from the internet, but keeping the network intact so that if someone is going to do the investigation, they're going to be able to look and see where that uh, bad actor was able to get in and kind of what files they were able to connect. So these are all things that you're going to need guidance with. Um, you may or may not have the internal resources, resources within your organization to get the answers to these things, but these are questions that you really need to start thinking about um, because if it does happen to you, there are things you're going to have to address. The next thing is, do you have backups of your data? Um, are they usable? For example, just because you're doing backups does not necessarily mean that they work. So if you do have backups and you have a backup um, process and program, have you tried to restore them anytime in, in the recent past to make sure that they work? And the last thing is actually something that a lot of people don't think about, is the data even worth recovering? So in the instance where um, Westchester, for example, their, their incident, they didn't have any private information or patron information that was actually exfiltrated or encrypted. So at that point, if it's not highly sensitive data then, and the ransomware attackers are just coming in to try to you know, victimize you, maybe it's worth saying, nope, we're good. We're not paying the ransom. Disconnect them and just factory default all the computers and start from scratch and re-image them, you know, have RCLS re-image them. You could save a ton of money. It might take you down for a couple of days, depending on how many computers you have. But if you know where your sensitive data is stored and um, what kind of sensitive, sensitive data you have, and then as this incident starts unfolding and you realize, well, you know, they, they've got our book index or something. I don't know. I'm not super familiar with all the different systems in a library system. but it's not, you know, it's not finance. It's not patron personal information and it's not HR information. Most likely it's not going to be that big of a deal, right? So knowing where your data is stored and then also, um, you know, what the value of that data is will also help you to make decisions about how to handle this incident. Does anybody have any questions? I was really hoping for a little more like back and forth. Go ahead, Bernard. Well, and and to to your point too, it's like it's 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 correct. Like part of this kind of starts to flush out, it starts to paint the bigger picture, which is okay. You're you have an accounting guy, you, or you have a, somebody who does the accounting even on one computer only, and all the files are on that one computer. Is that backed up? So so it really starts to you know get get an idea of where your vulnerabilities are. And the other thing too is um, we're talking about just one one particular case where there's ransomware, but these things morph all the time. And if the, the next big easily spread virus, they, it can use that, you know, there's been stuff in the, back, uh, in the past where it spreads from machine to machine without running anything on the machine. Um, and yeah, so, so really just having it on the, on the network can be a problem. So like first thing might be, you know, and again, you'd have to write, the, write this response. First thing might be unplugging it from the network, but leaving it turned on and working right. with your IT. But but yeah, it definitely is, um, you know, ideally you're going to get to a point where everybody, I mean, the, the IT staff has all the logs that they want. And, and it sounds like tech gibberish sometimes, but yeah, they'll know what they're doing. They'll look at it. They'll look at everything on the machine and they'll get an idea of how it got in and and how it's uh, and how to protect against it for the future. Yeah. Um, and a lot of times too, people will, you know, the, oh, oh, uh, Mary's got to be up and running. What do we do for Mary? Well, okay. We'll take Mary's computer and we'll give her a brand new machine. So Mary can work on the new machine if we're sure that no other machine has been affected. Um, and then Mary's hard drive will ultimately be on a shelf somewhere because um, we we might want to recover some more logs off of it or something like that. Right. And have it and have it completely air gapped and contained. So it's not on someone else's network, it's just on one machine. And I think you make some really um, valid and important points. If we go back to that first statement that I opened up with, it's like, even if it's the wrong action, at least you're doing something, right? So, so maybe unplugging it from the internet is might not be the right thing to do, but it's better than just sitting there doing nothing or just you know powering things down. So I, I definitely think that just going through these steps and having conversation um, 
Oh, thank you for that. Hold on, I'm just looking at the uh, the chat. So Anya and Mary say that even though the catalog isn't sensitive information, it would be a lot of work to re-enter the data. You're a thousand percent correct. And that is a business decision that the organization has to make. Um, so I'm, I'm speculating that the um, catalogs could be potentially backed up, right? That's something that you can create and then back up. So something that would be like in preparation for something like this, something that might you might want to consider is creating backups incrementally, storing the backups offline, so that when you're investigating this, if you can determine, oh, the bad guys have been on our network for a week or two weeks, because remember, we talk, we've talked about this a lot over the course of these trainings. These bad guys are not coming in on Monday and launching this massive attack on Tuesday. Usually there's a life cycle where they're doing reconnaissance, they're trying to figure out where your data is stored, they're trying to figure out who has the highest level of privilege and how, to, how they can escalate to that level of privilege. So most likely the bad actor has been in your network for way longer than you realize. And I think I've also mentioned in past um, trainings that in a traditional incident, whether it's a weather incident or an active shooter or something like that, there's, there's a very finite timeline. There's a beginning, a middle, and an end. In a cybersecurity incident, you're, you become aware of the incident as you're in the middle of it. You're already actively in the middle of it and you don't even realize it. So the beginning is now forensic, right? The beginning is actually what you have to go back and investigate and figure out. And so when you're involved in this and that timeline is different, um, Sometimes the bad guys could be in your network for a week or two weeks, it could be six months, in which case those backups are not going to do you any good because they're already infected. So if you try to restore the catalog, for example, with a backup from six months ago, and the forensics determined that these guys have been in there six plus months, then unfortunately you're in a position where you're going to have to um, either remediate the, the infection in the backup somehow, right, through a firm, or completely re-enter the data. And that's a business decision based on cost, right? What does it cost to get the, um, the, the malicious code remediated from a professional organization versus the cost of you guys actually re-entering the data? And so you're right. These are the types of questions that have to be brought up with your um, trustees with your staff, you know, and, and anybody else who's involved so that you can really figure out uh, what are the right business decisions for our organization. But great, great point. So the next part, um, the communications and reporting is also essential in this entire kind of um, incident response plan slash disaster recovery plan, planning phase of, of being involved in an event. Um, so the first question is, is there a business continuity plan? Typically, if you create the incident response plan, that should dovetail into the business continuity plan. And I always like to kind of make do those both almost in tandem because they're gonna they're going to um, uncover gaps within each other. And normally, so this is kind of a mock tabletop exercise. This is not a real tabletop. This I just wanted to work you through the workflow of what a tabletop would look like. But under nor normal circumstances, if I were to go to um, any one of your organizations and we actually started doing a tabletop exercise, we would pull in all the employees or a sampling of the employees, uh, any of the director level um, librarians, we would pull in at least one person from the board of trustees. We would pull in a legal representation, someone from our CLS, someone from your insurance company. And we'd all sit down and I'd throw this out. And now you guys would act as if we were in the middle of this event and have to tell me exactly what you're gonna do. And the purpose and the benefit of doing these kinds of things in a controlled environment is even if we have an incident response plan and a disaster recovery plan, Everything looks great on paper until we're in the middle of an incident and emotions are running high, people are freaking out. And then we realize, oh my gosh, we forgot to include the phone number for so-and-so or, oh my gosh, that person no longer works here. Holy cow, we have to, we have to you know, change that or update it. So by doing this annually, it's really important that it, it helps you to discover loopholes and gaps in the plan that looked so pretty on paper. So the question is, do you have a business continuity plan? 
Um, what do you need to report the attack? So we have to think about what information, go back to, is the information worth restoring, for example? You have different responsibilities in terms of reporting, um, depending on the type of data that's been stolen. So, you know, if you're if you're running credit card information or you're storing PII and that has been um, compromised, then you have a certain obligation to report in a certain way and a certain time frame. Different rules and regulations and laws require to report in a certain time frame. So, understanding what your obligation is and the type to report and based on the type of data is really important. The next question is, do you have a communications plan? And actually appended to that is, do you have one individual who is responsible for the communications? Because um, you should not have multiple people. It, just like any incident, whether it's the weather incident or the active shooter in a cyber incident, you should not have more than one person responsible for communicating to the public and communicating to internal resources. You want the messaging to be clear and you want it to be concise you want to give just enough detail to, to that you're resp responsible to give without giving away everything, right? My recommendation for communications plans is you have scripted, pre-approved communication um, dialogue, uh, and it could it could potentially be modified depending on the incident. But I think if you all come to the conclusion of what we want, what we agree is going to be approved messaging in the event of a ransomware attack, in the event of a business email compromise attack, um, it makes it a lot easier when something like this does happen to just have prepared information uh, than trying to build it from scratch. And again, trust me, when this stuff happens, the emotion level is like through the roof, right? Everybody's freaking out. Everybody's upset. Everybody's pointing fingers, you know, as to who's responsible for what. So um, having these pre-scripted pieces of communication and messaging is actually super, super help, helpful. Knowing who to report the incident to both internally and externally. You know, do you have a contract with RCLS? Hopefully you do. And if you do, who is the person at RCLS that you're supposed to be contacting? And then again, who are the external stakeholders that you should do? Do you notify the trustees? Um, do you have anyone else you're supposed to notify? How do you do this reporting? Is there a website or a portal that you're supposed to go to to do your reporting? Um, and then again, determining if you're obligated to report and you know to whom is important. That's predicated on the data or type of information that's been compromised. And then again, knowing what kind of data has been compromised, um, that's going to all feed into this whole communications plan. Um, does anybody that's on the call, um, do you know if you have a disaster, I'm sorry, a business continuity plan uh, when it comes to cybersecurity incidents? Are you aware of them? I'm going to take that as a no. I don't know if everybody's typing. <laughs> don't know. Okay. So as we could see right now, just having these conversations um, and based on, you know, everyone's, uh, anyone who is attached to a library, right, um, including trustees, uh, based on this information, like, you all have pretty important roles in your organization. And if you're not aware of that, then um, then that means that most of the, you know, just library clerks are, and other people are not aware of it. And so that's an issue because if something happens, everybody just kind of stands there. Arlette, did you have a question? Oh, no, I'm sorry. That was my, my, um, my little hand thing was right over you and it looked like a raised hand. Apologize. <laughs> my little uh, cursor guy. All right. So this kind of underlying thing, which happens at every organization. So again, this is no judgment. But when I work through these things, um, even in that K through 12 thing I was telling you I was doing the K through 12 presentation, um, we did break into groups. It was in person. They all had roles. And uh, these were IT directors. They were superintendents. They were administrators. And believe it or not, a lot of people within that group didn't know what they were supposed to do. They didn't know um, if the students were aware of what to do. They didn't know if the teachers were aware. So we've gotten into this habit um, of fire drills, active shooter drills, 
you know, all of these, things. We're, we're getting into the habit of doing these types of tabletop things, but cybersecurity is just sitting on the back burner. And unfortunately, um, you know, thankfully it's not kinetic, right? Thankfully, in most cases, it's not gonna result in loss of life or any kind of catastrophic loss, but financially it could be a huge loss. Disruption of services could be a huge loss. And so uh, we need to start incorporating these types of cyber events. And Bernard made a really good point. You know, this is just, we're just talking about a ransomware incident. What happens if it's a business email compromise incident? What happens if somebody takes down your website, they deface your website? What, how do you respond to that? So there are gonna be different incident response sections, if you will, on the various different types of cyber attacks that could happen. So just, um, I, I'd like for everybody to take note to that, that this is not the only type of way that libraries um, are affected. Ransomware is one of the most um, used methodology of attacking libraries and schools, but it's not the only one. And you know, when we think about kids and their capacity to get into things, because they're little buggers, um, defacement is a big one, especially in schools. And so libraries could also be subject to that, especially if kids are in your library using your computer terminals. So just be mindful that there are other types of incidents as well. I'm just doing a quick time check. Okay, we're good. So once we kind of go through all of these things, the next thing is an after action review. And these are kind of questions that you should consider um, after the incident is over that you wanna kind of go back and reflect on with your team um, and with anybody else who was involved in, in the event. I like having these after action review questions before an incident though, because it also helps you to think through incident response planning, right? So exactly what happened and, and when, um, how well did staff and management perform in dealing with the incident? This is gonna help you to determine if you need more training, or need more documentation, um, what information was needed sooner than it was available, right? So was there something that you had to know about that you didn't because it wasn't made available in time? Did you engage with the right teams to address? Now remember, all of these things, what it's gonna do is it's gonna shorten your recovery period. If you have all of these things um, kind of ironed out as best you can in advance, it's not going to stop you from becoming victimized of ransomware attack. But what it will do is help you to recover from it much more quickly, right? Um, it, again, we talk about it time and time again. The biggest vulnerability in any org organization is going to be the person. And so someone's going to accidentally click on something. Someone's going to accidentally download something that's going to result in this at some point, um, you know. And so being prepared, thinking, and I hate the saying, it's not, you know, if, it's when. That's not necessarily true. You know, you can do, do as good a job as you can to mitigate, but it can happen. And just knowing that you can be vulnerable and you are vulnerable kind of helps you to prepare for these things. Um, other things to think about. Um, did you bring uh, all the right groups, the, the people that were that should have been involved in it, and did they have the right information at the times that they needed needed it? Um, were any steps or actions taken uh, that might have inhibited the recovery, like the wrong action? We took a an action, but we took the wrong action. Should I have not unplugged the computer? Should I have not powered it down? What precluded us from getting information that we needed? Documenting all this stuff is really important. Um, how could information sharing with other organizations have been uh, improved? So if you have interdependencies from your library to, for example, a school district, and I don't know if you do or you don't, but if you've got some, some either API connections through software or network sharing or database sharing between you, your library and some other organization, whether it's a school or another library, um, then you know, could that have created some sort of incident for that organization? And, you know, should we have talked to them better or, or had better communications with neighboring organizations? Um, what corrective actions could prevent similar incidents in the future? What precursors or indicators should have been watched for uh, in the future to kind of detect similar incidents? Are there controls that we could put in place, things that we could have done to prevent some of this? And what are some additional tools or resources that we need in the future to detect, analyze, and mitigate future incidents? So as we kind of think about 
the greater landscape of our network systems, some people's networks are going to be more complicated than others. Um, and so you need to understand where all the vulnerable points could be, how um, your network potentially could be forward facing or your emails could be at risk or whatever it is, and then figure out what, what can we put in place that's within our budget uh, that can that's that has the value, the return on investment to say, if we invest in these tools, then you know the ROI is we're not going to be dealing with millions of dollars of data loss, right? Or dealing with you know, a week and a half or three weeks or whatever it is being being down. So these all of these things tie directly into the business objectives of the library. Does anybody have any questions about that or input feedback? Okay. So what are the key takeaways from this? Um, any action is better than no action, of course. There's always room for growth. Even the most mature organizations are constantly improving and changing the way, changing the way they do things because the threat landscape is constantly changing. So it, it is not a Ron Poe Peel, set it and forget it kind of situation. This is something that has to constantly evolve uh, with either you know, the increase or growth of your network or your library um, to just the, the changing landscape of threats. Uh, incident response plans and business continuity plans are iterative, which means we do not want to just create one and then let it sit on the shelf forever. I also want to make a statement. I know it's not sustainable, but you should print out your incident response plans and your disaster recovery plans because if your network is locked down and all of your files are encrypted and you can't access your incident response plan, then it's going to do you no good. So you should um, print that out. An incident response plan should not be uh, you know, 100 pages. It should be short, succinct, and very direct with kind of bulleted things to do and people to contact. So it's not like you're going to be printing out hundreds of pages. Um, and I know that we're all trying to do our sustainable library initiatives, but um, these are things I think that should be printed and, and stored somewhere where everyone who uh, potentially could be involved in the incident knows where it is, right? So if the library director is not there on a Saturday, whoever the people are in charge on Saturdays and Sundays, they should know where these plans are and they should be aware of them and um, what's in them. And then taking steps towards being prepared will pay off in dividends. Uh, it's very easy to kind of put our heads in the sand and say, well, this is not gonna happen to us. We don't have a lot of valuable information. And you know what, maybe um, to some, the information is not valuable, but to the library it is. So ransomware is not based anymore on the value of the data that you're housing. What these bad actors are recognizing is they don't really, in most cases, they're not going to, they don't want to sell your library patron information. They just know that if they lock your systems down, it's going to cost you money and it's going to be disruptive. And it's going to cause problems for the library. And so they know that that's got a value to it. And that's why they do it. They're not necessarily doing it because they want to sell your library patrons information or your employees information on the dark web. Although do be mindful that this new um, style of ransomware is you pay us the first ransom and we'll give you the key to unlock the data. But then you have to pay us a second ransom to stop us from making this information known on the web. So they're starting to get savvy where they're hitting people with two sets of ransom. And so um, just be mindful that if you end up paying a ransom for whatever reason, if that's the business decision that you make, and I don't necessarily recommend it, but if that's the business decision that you make to pay the ransom, then just know that you may end up paying a second ransom to prevent your data from being posted online or for them to make that um, event made known or made public. So as you go through these business decisions, just be mindful. Um, and I think I mentioned it on the last training, but it's worth mention mentioning again, these um, organizations that are committing these types of crimes, oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes the money that is paid in ransom are being filtered back to the government agencies to circumvent um, sanctions that these countries are being are facing. So Iran is known for um, putting these types of ransomware attacks out and using the money that they get 
in order to fund things like nuclear proliferation programs and things like that. So if you're making the business decision to pay a ransom, be mindful of where that money might end up. Um, it's never a good thing. Um, and then finally, ask for help. You know, contact people in other libraries, use your network, use RCLS, reach out to me. Um, if you have any questions, it's really important to kind of use your resources because you're not alone in this. Um, but, you know, you, you should start thinking about what are the things that you as an organization can do to help in the recovery speed if you are um, victimized in an incident like this. So I would like to open it up. Um, I will stop sharing my screen. And I would kind of like to get everybody's feedback on what they think about the information that was shared today. Was it helpful? Um, is it something that you think is actionable when you go back to your organization? You know, in, in a couple of things you said were, uh, I, I, I like a lot, Antoinette, because like the, the, the thing about the countries, um, you know, remote countries, it, that is exactly true. And that's one way that that um, that white hat hackers classify, um, you know, is what country these attacks are coming from in, in a lot of cases. And they do go to fund the, the like you said, fund stuff in that country, which is uh, rogue anyway, and continue to keep their own business going. Um, but the other thing too is if you if you use these exercises to just like a wide angle, like a wide angle lens and just really anything that you catch, any questions that you have, any questions, write them down, ask them, ask them of your staff, ask them of RCLS, ask them of your IT specialists, because um, there's no wrong answers. They should, they should really have uh, an answer for, you know, questions. They should have an answer for everything. Um, and it might, you know, one, one question might actually trigger, you know, the right, the right, uh, the right action, you know, the best action, so. Yeah. Does anybody else have any questions or feedback or did I scare the heck out of everybody again? I feel like I do that every time. <laughs> I'm hoping that everybody can see that there's a common thread with all of these trainings, right? We talked in, you know, we started out with just the basics of cybersecurity and, and what, you know, the CIA triad was and what that meant and the types of data. And then we started getting into um, you know, what our digital footprint looks like and how we engage online. And um, now you can see how the data, how we engage online, and then how these incidents can occur um, by weaponizing that information, right? So learning where people work, getting, you know, using central, um, social engineering in order to gain access to your uh, credentials, or even just knowing where you work and knowing what your email address is, figuring out or, or taking email addresses, you know, not always does, does someone want your email address and your password. Sometimes they just want email lists so they can send out mass amounts of spam with ransomware malware attached to it. So you think about all of these lists, you know, even our shopping cards and the things that we kind of put our email address in for everything. Every time we go and buy something in a retail store, what's your email address? We'll send you your receipt. Well, all of that gets put in a database. Those email addresses are now made public and that's how they get these lists of people to send information to. So I just hope that it kind of everything has been layering one thing on top of another so that everybody can recognize that it's all connected. Thank you, Antoinette. Are there any questions before we wrap up? Okay, great. This session will be recorded. It is recorded. So I'm going to stop the recording now.